Hello and welcome to lecture 8 in our ongoing series on Middle Egyptian and Hieroglyphics. This lecture is going to be a little different. Instead of covering uh, topics and concepts that have been described in a particular chapter in Hoke, we are instead going to go over some examples to reinforce ideas that have been covered earlier in this lecture series. So we will be looking at examples specifically from Hoke 1 through 4. And by examples, I don't mean those sentences that are intermittent in the chapters. Rather, I mean the homework problems that are given as examples in the back of the book. Uh, if you look at the, the end of Hoke, some of the homeworks have solutions. We will be going over some of those. And the reason I chose those in particular is because, one, I cannot mess up the translation because Hoke has done it for me, and two, because it prevents you from using these videos to cheat on your homework, which I would rather people not do with this. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to be looking at two examples each from chapters 2, 3, and 4. I did not pick chapter 1 because chapter 1 is very basic, and if you understand the things from 2, 3, and 4, you will understand all the exercises in chapter 1 without issue. We're going to start with 2.1, uh, that is to say, chapter 2, exercise 1. Uh, and we're going to go through this one in more detail than I plan to go through on the others. Uh, this is because I want to give you an idea in depth of the process I use in solving a particular example. Uh, also for this one, I'm going to assume that you don't know all the words immediately. For future examples, I'm going to assume that you have looked up any word you don't know once you found the word boundaries, but that's not going to be the case for this one. So let's say you have this sentence. It's presented to you on a quiz or a homework or whatever, and you need to figure out what it means. Well, the first thing you need to do is find the word boundaries. If you can't figure out where all the words are, you will have absolutely no luck in solving it. And you probably want to move in order from left to right in doing so, at least as best you can, um, because oftentimes you'll be able to immediately identify the first word in the sentence. And if you have been paying attention to these lectures, you almost certainly can. The first word is you. Uh, that's our particle that starts sentences. Extremely common, especially at this stage. It just opens a basic declarative statement of fact kind of sentence. And then we can notice a couple other words that are immediately recognizable. For example, we have a word for this, pen. So we can mark that out as being a definite word. We can also use another demonstrative, pen, which also means this, but it's just the feminine form of it. So that solves a couple of issues for us. And then the next thing that we probably want to turn to is the fact that there's an N standing alone. N commonly is a preposition, uh, either as a genitival adjective sort of preposition or as a uh, dative preposition, meaning two or four. We also have, so we have N, and then we have some characters, and then we have a demonstrative. And if those characters are a noun, which if we look in the dictionary, we'll find that it is, then we have a what is definitely a prepositional phrase. N, noun, 10, which is this, uh, would form a coherent grammatical unit. So we can put a boundary between n and our noun, which is set, meaning woman. Uh, and then finally, we know the verb jed. That means to speak. That's pretty common. Put a line there. We might not know what that word coming after jed is, but we know that that's a single word. Uh, or perhaps it is two words, but considering there's only two characters, that is unlikely. Now we put down the transcription of all of the words. We've already identified them, so it won't go through each one with you. Uh, but we, for, again, for our purposes, we're going to pretend we don't know what that word is, and we're going to proceed as though we don't know it. And now what we need to do is ascribe grammatical properties to each of these words. So I'm going to go through them first and then show you the answers. Uh, you is a particle. We know that pretty well. It starts a sentence. And then we have jed. Jed is a verb. We already know that it's possible to have a sentence that goes you, and then a verb, and then what we'd expect next is the subject. And we can assume that this word is a noun because it's followed by pen. So you have an adjective modifying something, adjectives modify nouns, it must be a noun. And it also is where you would expect the subject of the sentence to sit. 
So we can probably say that this mystery word plus pen is a noun phrase acting as our subject. And then n set pen would be a adverbial comment on that. It's a prepositional phrase. n is a preposition, set is a noun, 10 is a demonstrative pronoun, which functions as an adjective. And then we can start translating the individual words. Again, this is all stuff you can look up in the dictionary. Uh, you does not need translation. Jed means says. We don't know what that mystery word means, but there is a, a picture of what looks like a writing implement uh, and a guy sitting down. So it's probably a profession having to do with writing or painting or something, which means that it probably is a scribe. Um, in, in case you can't make that out, that is, by the way, two containers of ink uh, and a brush, the, the, the scribe's tools. Uh, pen means this. N is either to, for, or of, although since it says or speaks, it's probably going to be to, because that's the thing you most logically associate with speaking. You speak to someone more than you speak for someone or of someone. Those are things that like can happen, but less commonly than speaking to. Uh, set means woman, and ten is also a demonstrative meaning this. It's different from pen because, remember, of the, uh, the gender, the grammatical gender of woman. And then we can put it in our translation. Um, this is the point where you would look up that word. First of all, uh, the word happens to be sesh. It does mean scribe. And then you can, with all the words together and an understanding of the grammar, you can translate it. This scribe speaks to this woman. Simple sentence. They get harder. Now here's our next sentence. Uh, I'm not going to show you how you get the word lines here. I'm going to trust that you understand them. This is... The answer, uh, most of these are pretty clear, I think. The only place where they could have some ambiguity is whether it is mu weben or mu ben, i.e. if the W is a phonetic complement to mu. Um, it's not a phonetic complement, and one way to know this is that mu is basically never written with phonetic complements. Uh, also, ben is not a word. So if, if you encounter a situation where there's a bit of ambiguity, look up the possible words that it could be, uh, and if none of them line up, then, or if one of them has, like, if one of them doesn't line up and one of them does, then you know it's the one that contains actual words. Polk is not in the business of, of making things up, generally. Uh, and then uh, we would get our transcriptions of everything, which again, uh, so this works out to be mek defet cher mu weben ra em achet. All of these should be things that you know, all these signs, other than the, the horizon, the achet. Um, that's a triliteral. And is the sun setting in a valley behind some mountains. Uh, it, and that means horizon. And now we need to go over the grammar of all of this. So mek, again, an introductory particle, means look. Uh, and we have, then have a noun, defet, and that means we're dealing with a non-verbal sentence. Uh, so defet chermu means upon the water. Uh, so clearly that is the thing being affixed to our noun in our non-verbal sentence. But th that would be a complete sentence. But then we had a verb, weben, uh, and that posed an interesting question. We had a complete sentence. Why is there a verb? Well because now we're entering a subordinate clause. If you see a verb in the circumstantial, and it follows what looks like an already complete sentence without introduction, that generally means you're dealing with a circumstantial clause. In this case, weben is in the present active. So the weben, the shining, is happening at the same time as whatever the depet boat is doing. Uh, and then moving forward, you have ra, is the subject of weben, uh, ra being the sun, em achet, in the horizon. So you have two circumstantial clauses, really, or you have two you have two clauses, one of which is a circumstantial clause. Uh, mek defet chermu is a full sentence, and then it takes as a circumstantial clause, aka as a longer adverbial comment, weben ra, ra em achet. And weben ra em achet is itself a verbal clause. It has a verb weben governing the subject ra, 
uh, with an adverbial comment m achet. That's how you write out all the parts of speech. And now we can write down the meaning of each of the words. And then it's, this is a pretty simple one to translate. Look, the boat, because you can supply an article in Egyptian whenever it's necessary, uh, since they wouldn't write those down, is, because the Egyptians didn't use is, they just would put the two almost next to each other. So the boat is upon the water. And then we have a circumstantial clause that's in the present, uh, which kind of conveys the connotation of simultaneously. Uh, so probably while is the best coordinating conjunction to use here, or subordinating conjunction to use here. So while the sun is shining in the horizon, or the sun shines in the horizon. Um, the second one is probably a little better because we'll, we'll get into progressive clauses later. That's a whole different thing. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple one to translate as long as you are careful about your sentence structure. That is the real crux of what I'm getting at today. Be careful about your sentence structure. It will be your best friend for your studies of all of Egyptian. Just make sure the sentence is ordered as you think it is and then translate the words and, pu and put them in the slots of that sentence order and you will be fine. You'll be able to translate anything. Now we move on to 3.5 from example three. Um, this, you know, being a later chapter, there's a little more vocabulary, but conceptually, it is not that difficult. Uh, here again, we're gonna start with the word boundaries. You'll note that that double written sign represents a single word, um, Tawi, the two lands. Um, and you will also note that Reshut has two determinatives following it that is perfectly allowed. Uh, other than that, nothing particularly difficult about this. We'll write down the transcription. And now we can get to the really fun part, which is analyzing the grammar. So our sentence starts with you, totally expected as a statement of fact. And then we have neb. Neb is a noun. That means we're dealing with a nonverbal clause. And then we have another noun, which is Tawi, two lands. So probably we are dealing with a construct, uh, a possessive relationship of Neb Tawi, the lord of the two lands. This is actually a very good educated guess to make because the phrase lord of the two lands shows up all the time. Uh, it's a very common phrase. So if you see, if you see that construction, you're almost certainly dealing with a, or dealing with that particular phrase. And then the next thing we'd expect after our noun is our adverbial comment. And we find a preposition, M, which is a good sign that we have analyzed the sentence correctly. M reshut, enjoy. That's a perfectly fine adverbial comment. But then we find another preposition, which implies more adverbial comment coming after that. Cher, kat, ten, and aat. So cher is a preposition that mean, it can mean upon, like in that sentence about the boat, where a boat's like sitting on top of the water, but it can also mean concerning. And then ta'at means building project, and it's going to be modified by two adjectives, ten, this, and ra'at, which is great. So this ultimately does produce a coherent sentence structure. And then if we look at the meaning of each word, again, this once we've analyzed the sentence structure and how the words relate to each other, uh, specifically the two prepositional phrases acting as an adverbial comment modifying the lord of the two lands, we can come up with the meaning without any great difficulty. The lord of the two lands is in joy concerning this great construction project. Again, no great difficulty as long as we go through and properly analyze it first. Then we have example four, which I picked because it was a bit of a longer sentence, um, a, a little bit more difficult in theory. So let's take a look at the boundaries. You'll note there's a couple of, of suffixes and I've, um, I've divided them all up 
separate from their words, which is not quite correct, but it is still helpful to do for analysis, even if it's not how the Egyptians themselves would have regarded these words. And then we will just transcribe everything. Uh, you'll note that I have marked all of the things that I suspect are suffixes with dashes. Uh, you can also use dots, whatever. You just have to indicate that it's attached to the word, not totally separate, not totally part of it. And now we have to go through all the parts of speech again. Mech, introducing a statement of fact, but with a, uh, a connotation like look, you know, a little, a little more emphasis. And then we have a noun, moot, mother, uh, modified by the demonstrative ten. Okay, that's fine. We have our nonverbal sentence. And then we have another noun. So probably this is a construct. Bach, specifically Bach ek. Uh, Bach means servant. Modified by that suffix, it becomes your servant. And then we can probably use the construct. So this mother of your servant. And that's the whole subject of our circum of our nonverbal sentence, nonverbal clause, really. And then we get the adverbial comment. Emper or empera in her house, nejes, an adjective, that's going to modify the noun pair, so in her little house, charides chenaes. That's a little more interesting. Uh, this is more, this is really kind of its own um, circumstantial statement of fact kind of clause. Charides, uh, her children, chenaes, with her. So that's also an adverbial comment, but it's kind of, it's, it could stand on its own sentence. Her children are with her, but in this case, it's part of the whole statement about the mother of your servant. So here we have, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is a mistake that I make that is, is easy for you to make as well. Net, I confuse net and ten. Uh, this, I'm going to keep this in and not re-record, not only because I do not feel like it, but also because it is illustrative of a, an easy mistake to make, which is confusing net and ten regarding feminine nouns. Net is the genitival adjective. It means of. Uh, ten is the demonstrative. It means this. Now, in this case, that genitival adjective, if it were ten, it would be this mother of your servant because you'd still have the construct. If it were a... If it's the genitive, it's just the mother of your servant, which is the correct translation. Uh, my apologies. Do watch out for that. That's rather important. Um, we'll see that in a minute when we get to the translation, what it is properly supposed to be. But again, um, an illustrative mistake for you, I hope. And then, of course, we have a couple of suffixes. Uh, everything else having been gone over and pulled that S, I have to give you these are just suffixes because space is limited on these. Uh, and then the tra uh, the transcription of all the words, and then the translation as I provided. Um, the mo look, the mother of her, your servant is in her little house, her child with her, or her child being with her, or something like that. Uh, it's a little awkward in English. You could say uh, with her child, but that would not accurately get across the phrasing of the Egyptian, which is more of the point of this. And again, genitive net, not demonstrative. Ten, be careful, do not make the mistake that I made probably two dozen times in my undergraduate. And now we get to move on to the examples from lesson four. Uh, this one is, is number two. Uh, and we're going to get into the predicate adjective on this one, which is a new sentence structure that we haven't covered yet. Because when we, when we divide up the words... We notice, first of all, there isn't any particle starting out. There's no you or whatever. Uh, the word that starts is benri. And if we look in our dictionary, we find that benri is an adjective. And if you remember from lesson four, a predicate adjective can begin a sentence. Just an adjective, and you're going to be directly equating it with something. And we're following it with an emphatic. Um, so it's not just sweet, it's how sweet. Uh, and then we do get a noun. We get uh, a, a noun that is depet, 
that means taste. Not to be confused with depet boat. You'll note the different determinative. Um, depet with a tongue means taste. Depet with a boat means boat. Uh, and then we have net again, important. That's the genitival. Uh, and then another noun, honey. So noun phrase, depet, net, deep, the taste of honey. Uh, oh, yes, I'll put the um, trans... I put that in the wrong order. Oh, yes, uh, never mind. But yeah, this is the... I, I, did, I did this one in the wrong order. Uh, so I've kind of revealed the answer of what everything is, just so you can see what the words are in the transcription, which, which is the first stage generally. Uh, it does in truth it doesn't matter which of those two stages you do first just as long as you're coming out of it with an understanding of the word order and of the uh, the transcription of each word then you have nefersi uh, that's another adjective and followed by that uh, the C is the emphatic form of the suffix S. So it is, actually, I, I believe I've gotten that wrong. My apologies in my transcription. That is, uh, I misspoke and may have miswritten it. That should be the dependent form of the third person masculine singular or feminine singular yes yes c is the the dependent pronoun not the suffix pronoun um as i thought yes so that is it is it's really her but because we're dealing with a feminine noun um it can also it would be better translated as it uh, and then you have a comparative uh if you have the preposition r but it's going to be acting as a comparative uh, when we find our translation, uh, modifying hetu nebet, uh, em ta pen, which altogether translates to anything which is in the land, in this land. A little convoluted, but it'll become clear when we look at the translation. So, ben are we starts the sentence, how sweet, uh, and it's being equated with the taste of honey. Depet net. Bennet, or Bint in some transcriptions. Uh, and then we have another sentence which is technically subordinate there too, or I suppose you could you could render it as being subordinate as being like an adverbial comment, or you could just render it as a totally separate sentence, and both of those would be appropriate. Um, Nefer C, it is good, er Hetu nebet from, but in this case it's being used as a comparative, so better than rather than good from. Hetu nebet, all things em ta pen in this land. How sweet is the taste of honey? It is better than anything in this land. And then we are also going to do, uh, our for our final example, we're going to do 4.4, .4, which is especially long. Uh, first, we will, we will divvy up the words, and then we'll start breaking things down. So nefer, uh, that's, a, that's an adjective. We just encountered it, and that means we're dealing with a predicate adjective type sentence. So we are now going to expect a noun, and we get it. Uh, sa, meaning sun. Uh, and then we get something kind of interesting. We get a verb. Sejem, uh, specifically Sejem Map. Um, so Sejem means to hear, Sejem F, he hears, or perhaps listens, uh, and then N Etef, to his father. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, Et is father, the F in the father is silent, and you take another, another thing. So this is kind of an odd sentence structure, uh, but what ends up happening is you have two complete sentences. You have nefer sa, good is a son, uh, or good is the son, 
and then Sejimef and Itas, which is hears his father or listens to his father, something like that. You have the Sejim, uh, the Sejim clause is subordinate to Nefersa. And you can kind of infer the relationship to be a relative one. That is to say, good is a son who listens to his father. Uh, because, again, a circumstantial acts as an adverbial comment modifying the noun of the sentence. Uh, so that's what that whole thing together means. A little convoluted. That good is a son who listens to his father. UF. We've got a new sentence. And we are starting it off with a suffix pronoun, he. Uh, because remember, you does not take the dependent pronouns as you would expect. It takes the suffix pronouns. So, uf, he, um, em, chered, nefer, we. Uh, em, chered is uh, in a child, nefer, we, nf. Um, this is beautiful, or how beautiful uh, to him or for him. Sefer uh, pen m ebef ra neb. So it is again. It is good for son to hear his father when he is in childhood. The Egyptian doesn't have a separate word for childhood. Uh, it's just in child. Seher uh, is a, not a super common word. It means advice, and that renders the next part. Uh, Nefer we, how good, again, this is a standard predicate adjective type of clause. Um, to, NF, to him or for him, seher advice, pen modifying that, this, M Eve F or Neb, in his heart every day. So the translation of this rather convoluted sentence works out to be, good is the son who listens to his father when he is a child. How good is he who keeps this advice in his heart every day? And going back and breaking it down so we understand where this translation comes from. Nefer sa, good is the son. That part's simple. Sejimef and Itef. Who listens to his father? It's a circumstantial clause modifying the sa. And then we have another circumstantial clause. Uf m chered. Uh, Literally, that would just be, he is a child, but because this is circumstantial, it has to be somehow subordinated. And the most likely meaning here is when, because uh, there's no past indicator, so it must be simultaneous, so it must be when he is a child. And that produces a good and coherent thought. Good is the son who listens to his father when he is a child. Makes sense. We can trust it and move on. Nefer we. How good... Uh, NF, I have, I have it translated is he, uh, but it might be better even translated as how good is it for him, um, which is, yeah, again, a little more accurate. They both get the sentence across. Sefer pen m eb. Uh, this advice in his heart, ra neb, every day. Uh, English requires a verb here. Egyptian does not. Uh, but English wants the verb keep, who, who keeps this advice in his heart. Right? We can't just say, for whom this advice is in his heart. That would be a really weird phrasing, but that's what the, Egyptians, the Egyptian is literally saying here. But the general gist of it is, he who keeps this advice in his heart, ra neb, every day. Uh, a quick word on neb. Before we end the video, neb has two meanings. One of them is lord, but the other one is every. We have seen both of them. Note that every is an adjective and lord is a noun, which means that usually lord is preceding another noun, the lord of something, whereas um, every is or all is usually after a noun because it's usually modifying it as an adjective. That's how you can make an educated guess about which one it is. All right.
thank you for watching. I know this one was a lot. Uh, I know that I myself made one or two mistakes in this. Uh, so I hope you can see where some common pitfalls are, uh, like making sure to get all the meanings, the words down as you're translating uh, these sort of convoluted sentences, remembering your differences between yet and ten, uh, these sorts of things. But I, I do hope this has equipped you a little better to take on the, uh, the difficulties of the homeworks in these chapters. Uh, the next video, which may be somewhat delayed in coming out, uh, will cover some of the topics in Chapter 5 as we get to the exciting world of infinitives.